So good to be here, and uh, as I said, Lisa and I have been on break. Um, it's been a, a great and much needed break, and I drove so much, guys. I might as well have been back in Hawaii, you know what I'm talking about? So much time on the road, driving around, and listening to Siri, listening to <laughs> and my beautiful wife telling me where to turn and, and all of that. It was, it was a lot. It was a lot. Um, when we finally got to Oregon, and while we were in Oregon, we finally got this family. We always do this every year. Last year, COVID, we couldn't do it. We go to one hour south of Eugene, Oregon. And at there, we go to this, uh, my, my brother's in-law's family um, property right on the Umpqua River. And we were there for a week and just sitting in, in inner tubes and just circling in that pond and in that river. I promise you, it was awesome. But when I was there, one of the most important things that I did was I always bring books with, for, with me to read. I'll read historical fiction. I'll read a biography. That's the best way that I learned. But these books, I thought that I needed to bring this because of what's been happening in America in the last eight years, in the last two years. Uh, it was important. So I brought along these books with me. The first one is 1776 by David McCullough. I was reading about the origins. I haven't learned about the revolution since I was the fourth grade or maybe even the seventh grade. So I wanted to read this because uh, I thought it was important for me to know as a believer in Jesus Christ and as a citizen who can considers himself a Hawaiian who's also a patriot, how do I work this out? Talk back to me. Come on, on top row. You know, I'm pastor's back. Pastor's back. I don't know if you got tongue-tied and quiet at the movies, but now you can give me an amen. amen. Thank you. And so I read that book, and I felt like that book was like, oh, fair. It's fair. Uh, it, the guy doesn't, isn't necessarily a Christian, um, but he gives George Washington his due in the end in the last chapter, so I thought it was fair. And then I read, picked up another book that I thought was really important, America's Expiration Date by Cal Thomas, who is syndicated columnist for the last 30 years that I've been reading every once in a while in the paper. And Cal Thomas says, every great civilization has about 250 years where they, they are strong. And at the end of that 250 years, they kind of, they, they lose their strength. They still exist, but they cease to exist the way that they used to. And so when he compares the Greek Empire, he compares the Roman Empire, even though those were civilizations that lasted a long time, they actually had 200 to 250 years of strength. Uh, real appropriate for today. Then I read The Magna Carta of Humanity by Oz Guinness. He's a theologian and how important the Magna Carta was to the founding of this nation. And then my friend Phil Cook, on this book called The Way Back. I read more on my vacation than I really wanted to, but I felt like I needed to get ready for this series because I want to preach a series for the next three to four weeks. My job is to connect the dots, the founding of this nation that goes all the way back to Great Britain, and let's take it all the way back to the first five books of the Bible in the Torah and the Pentateuch. And now I want to connect the dots to the revolution, to the first and second great awakening that takes us to the missionaries coming to Hawaii in 1820 when Hawaii became a Christian kingdom under our ali'i. And let me tell you, the greatest revival in the history of the world, top 10 by Elmer Towns, the historian, biblical uh, the theologian, top 10 in the history of the world, counts Hawaii number seven. I think we need history. I think we need biblical history. If we don't know history, we're doomed to repeat it. And so what's, what's going on in this world, I thought that it was really important. You know me, I love sports. Um, one of my greatest football coaches of all time, I love Tom Landry, the late Tom Landry from the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, don't get excited, Cowboy fans. I'm not there anymore. But back then, <laughs> but back then, let me tell you, when I loved the Cowboys, Tom Landry was a Christian. He was a believer, and he was my model citizen when it came to class in coaching. Uh, before that, there was a man named Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi was um, um, coach of the Green Bay Packers. And when he took over in 1961, um, the Philadelphia Eagles had won the championship and they had lost. But then coach Vince Lombardi takes over the team. And even though they came in second that year, the, the, the veterans were coming in. They were excited about the team. And um, Lombardi realized that every time he teaches his new football team, he has to start with the basics. So when he, on the first day of training camp, he sits down with all of the veterans, all the rookies, all of his star players, and he grabs a football and he says, gentlemen, this is a football. These are the laces of a football. And he begins to break down a football and he teaches them how to tie their shoes. He's starting from the basics. And can you imagine the veterans and the star players who were there said, Wait, we just came in second last year. Why are you talking about this is a football? This is what I believe today, folks. 
This is a Bible. 66 books written by 40 authors. And I want to talk to us about something as simple as the Bible. This is how we find our way back as a nation. This is how we find our way back. All of the different things that have been going on, and I've been gone for about five weeks, and maybe, maybe some of you thought that I didn't say enough. I'm on vacation. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not going to make a stand, take a stand while I'm on break because these breaks are few and far between. And so if you didn't see a lot of activity on Instagram, that was by design, everybody. Just want to let you know. But I want you to know that something was stirring inside of me. So on the last week of the vacation, I look at Lisa and I said, I really feel like I need to go to the nation's capital. I'd been there before, right before COVID hit. I was at the president's national prayer breakfast, which happens for every president. And I was there, both sides of the aisle, Democrat and Republican, an incredible place to be in January of 2020. While I'm there, the rumblings of the nation are happening. I'm keeping my eye on Singapore and Asia. I'm preparing the church for what could be the inevitable. I'm concerned about lockdowns and shutdowns. And of course, now we're even more concerned than ever before. We saw 60% of small businesses not even make it. We saw all the restaurants on Yelp, 40% closed. Yelp says 40% to 50% of the restaurants have closed. We've seen the mental health crisis happen to our teenagers as a result of the shutdown. I never knew this was going to happen in January. So I say we got to find our way back, church. We need to find our way back. I looked at Lisa and I said, I got to go to DC. She goes, what for? I said, I'm not going there to be a tourist to look at monuments. I'm going to the Museum of the Bible. That's where I'm going. You might be thinking, there's a Museum of the Bible? Yes, there is. Sounds cheesy. That's what I thought. But when I got there in January of 2020, I had a one-hour tour. I wish I had a week. And when I walked into that place, I was amazed. And when I walked out of that place, into that place again, I brought a camera crew with us, Phil Cook, my friend who became the producer. We shot four videos there. We shot another one for Memorial Day weekend because since we're there, we might as well for more Memorial Day weekend 2022. Already getting my ducks in a row. And while I was there, I thought that this series that I'm going to do on television and on the internet will be about faith in America. But today I want to go on a different angle with our church in person because that's my primary responsibility is this church. So I have been given a prominent place, an important place in Hawaii. God has given me a voice in this state. People look to me, and sometimes I don't want that, but it is what it is. Inspire Church, we can't hide anymore. We can't stay under the radar. They know. And so I I think that this is my primary concern and responsibility online. I love you, but I got to tell the people in the house that I want to teach what has not been taught since I was in the fourth or seventh grade. I want to teach what is being retaught. I want to teach the biblical foundations of this nation in case you weren't taught it and in case you didn't know or in case you forgot. Somebody, come on, give me an amen. So behold the blackboard again. And so when I look at the blackboard and I look at the timeline, it took me all the way back to the Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta, I didn't even know what the Magna Carta was. I thought it was the name of a credit card, the Magna Carta, MasterCard. I don't know. It means the Grand Charter, and I'll explain that next week. But then we'll go to the Gutenberg Press in 1454. Uh, then we'll go to the Protestant Reformation in 1517. Stick with me, stick with me now. I don't want to lose you right now. Okay, stay with me. And then in 1620, the Mayflower Compact, where 41 heads of families that were on the Mayflower that fled Europe and Great Britain because they needed, because of religious persecution, they wanted to come to America that was already settled in some respect in order to practice religion freely and in order to propagate the gospel. That's why they came here. And when they got off of that boat, before they got off, 41 heads of families put their names to paper on parchment with quill pen and said, we obey, we will obey the rule of the law that is being set. And this is our grand charter for the United States before there was a United States of America and how we will live. Then I want to talk about the 1776 American Revolution. Listen to me, folks. If there was no revolution, we would still be British. British subjects. There was a revolution that was necessary before that. Let me tell you, and I want to compare it to the French Revolution of 1789. 76. I'm talking fast because I'm excited and I got a lot of material. 1789, the French Revolution. Tale of Two Cities. Remember that book? You know how that ended? Madame Guillotine, where they killed you with the guillotine and cut off your heads. Back then, blood was spilled incredibly. I want to compare both revolutions, but I want to talk about a great awakening here of a revival of Jesus Christ in America before the revolution. I want to talk about the second great awakening here and how 
how that role played in solving some of the Civil War's problems, which were major, and how he, that ended up here, but here on how God was using that for the missionaries to come to Hawaii through Opukahaia, a, a young boy that got on a ship, a seal ship that made its way to New England. I stood in front of the church where Opukahaia was, but he died in 1818 of typhoid fever. And because the missionaries were so moved by his testimony and by his life that they decided to risk everything, sell everything, and get on the Thaddeus and make its way over here to Hawaii by 1820 and how the Ali'i received the word of God, especially Kamehameha II, Kamehameha III, Queen Liliokalani. And we're even talking about the missionaries' missteps in this state as well. But well, no, we, that's not a highlight, though. <laughs> I just want you to know. Yeah. I want you to know the highlight is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Through it all. Can I get an amen? amen? So now, Amos chapter 8, verse 11 says this. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food, of thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. In other words, A.W. Tozer writes in 1947 in his book, The Pursuit of God. He said, it is a solemn thing and no small scandal in the kingdom to see God's children starving while actually seated at the Father's table. Think about that for a moment. Starving while seated at the Father's table. This is a Bible. This is a Bible. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. The Bible is the most important thing that you could read. I forgot my statistics. I left it at home. But the statistics show us that Bible reading has plummeted. But although during COVID, it went up. The the, the average American has four Bibles in their home. That's amazing. The average Kai family has 12. Um, When you think, we have a lot of Bibles in our house. If you need a Bible, come ask me. I'll give you a Bible. Um, When you think about what God is doing, it is the Word of God. The way back is through the Word. But when I looked at the Word of God, it was so important in the Protestant Reformation. In 1517, Martin Luther, remember him? Martin Luther nailed to the door of of Wittenberg 95 problems with the church. The bulletin board of the community was often the big doors of the church. So people would come up here, big sale, uh, selling my bike, you know, I'm talking about Uber driver. But back then, if you had a problem, the original social media was the church doors back then. So you go to the church doors, and Martin Luther, who was a scholar, uh, an incredible scholar, he also was a devout Catholic, had 95 problems that he had with the church at the time that was selling, Catholics don't get mad at me, who was selling indulgences, the church, in order to get people out of purgatory so that they could fund St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. I'm going to get a letter on that one. But let me think, think about that for a moment. So he was calling it out. That's what Martin Luther was doing. And as a result, he protested what was happening. It was the birth of the Protestant Reformation. The biggest problem that Martin Luther had anyway wasn't necessarily about the indulgences. His biggest problem was that the Word of God never got to the people. The Word of God was chained in churches. As a matter of fact, I saw a replica of a big Bible. It took forever for them to print them. They were huge. They were massive. They were big. And they literally were chained to the pulpits back then. Because there was, there, was, there was the only Bible in the city or in the town. And so he had a problem because it was written in Latin. And because it was written in Latin, nobody could read it. And he said, we are in Germany. We're in Wittenberg. We can't read this. No wonder nobody's set free. No, mo- no wonder people are kept in the dark. No wonder there's no freedom. No wonder there's so much darkness. No wonder. And as a result of that, the Reformation took place. And then he, was, he had five solas, S-O-L-A. And the word sola or sola scriptura means in Christ alone, but also in scripture I trust. And it was in the scriptures, he said, that was so important that we needed sola scriptura. We needed the word of God, that the common man needed to read it in their common language. And as a result of that, um, he took advantage of what was happening here um, with the Gutenberg Press when Johannes Gutenberg in 1454, who was a printer, he owned his own printing company. Uh, he, he was able to print tracts. He was able to print books. But back then, if you were going to print a Bible, it would take forever. As a matter of fact, you would have scribes and scribes with original hoodies back then. And they had a playlist and they had, you know what I'm saying? And the playlist on Spotify was, ah, 
And these men dedicated their lives to writing this down and ma making sure that more people had the word of God, but it was all written in Latin. And at that time, it would take over a year to print one Bible. It was incredibly expensive. But then when Johannes Gutenberg created his press, his press was different. It wasn't made out of wood. It was made out of metal. And he was able to produce more. Back then, if you had 1,286 days, it took one day to print one page. So 1,286 pages of the Bible it was. But when Johannes came in, he printed the first Bibles in 150 from his press, first edition in Latin, Today, 48 exists. I saw four of them in the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. But let me tell you, now the Bible was written in German. Then enter William Tyndale. William Tyndale, years later, needed the Bible in English. The Church of England had split from the church at large, the Catholic Church, because King Henry VIII wanted to live the way that he wanted to live. So he created his own church called the Church of England at that time. And so now you have two different churches. And because he did not want Scripture in English, lest the English subjects read the Scripture and realize that they are free indeed, then he said that anyone who is caught with any parchment of Bible will be burned at the stake. William Tyndale was a crafty man and a businessman at the same time. He practiced his own level of covert resistance. He moved himself to Brussels. While in Brussels, he was printing pages of the Bible and all of his mistake pages, he bound into other books and he sent them to England thinking, and the British saw it and they said, oh, we found William Tyndale's versions. And they thought that they had discovered gold while William Tyndale was taking the perfect editions and sending it the other way. He was found to have... Um, possession of those tracts, they brought him to, back to Great Britain where he literally was burned at the stake for the word of God. This is a Bible. This is a Bible. In many countries, this is outlawed if this is found in certain parts of the Middle East, if this is found in certain parts of China. Uh, the Chinese would take these pages, they would tear them, and they literally would memorize them. They would roll it up, they would hide it in their mouth, they would smuggle it in their clothing in, in different parts of their body just because they needed the Word of God. It is a crime to be sitting at the Father's table and starving at the same time. I'm here to preach a message that the way back for America is not necessarily through normal avenues. The way back is through the Word of God. When we read the Word of God, we will realize that we are free and that we are free indeed. Free indeed. So number one, what has the Bible meant to me since I gave my life to Jesus? Number one, the Bible is the inspired, God-breathed Word of God. All 66 books, inspired and God-breathed. You'll find people who will say, or you, you'll go to college and they're going to try and argue with you. Yeah, it was man-made. Of course, of course, machines put this thing together. Well, let me talk to you about that. But let me tell you, God spoke through the power of the Holy Spirit that inspired men to write it. If God can bring circumstances in all of your life together, don't you think he can get, bring writers together and put it all together and say, this is what I ultimately want in my book for the next two, three millennia? He can. And so that's what it is. It's inspired. The word inspired means breath of God. Theos and pneuma. Theos means God in the Greek. Pneuma means breath. It is God breathed. These pages have been God breathed. And every time you open up God, this God breathed pages, God, God breathes back on us. And there's 66 books in here, and it is most powerful. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all Scripture, everybody say all Scripture. All Online say all Scripture. All Scripture is inspired, is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God wants to equip us through the breathed on Word of God. Number two, the Bible is my spiritual armor, and it is my arsenal. It is my armor and my arsenal. I think now more than ever before, Christians need to be armored up, so to speak, because of what's happening in our world today. Not just in our world, in the spiritual realm. Not just what's happening in Hawaii, but in the realm of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 says this, and a final word Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. This is what he says. Come on. He says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, because we need strength today. He says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. You know the devil's got all kinds of strategies? He's got a strategy to divide this nation. He's even got a strategy to divide this church. 
if he can get the mass and the unmasked, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated to be at odds with one another, if he can cause another shutdown, we ain't shutting down, if he can cause all these different things, I can tell you right now that the devil is doing everything that he can to divide this church. I will not let him. We will not let him in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Nah. No, we're not fighting against skin on skin, color on color. You know what I'm talking about? We're not flesh and blood. We're not fighting that. What are we really fighting? Evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world. You can't see it, but it's there. Against mighty powers in this dark world. Against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the Lord and the good news that you will be, be, be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. And of course, that will happen, of course. And then in verse 17, but, on the, but put on the salvation of your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and then verse 18, if you got it, put it up there. I'm going to read it. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. It says, take out the sword of your spirit. This is your sword of your spirit. I got to download Bible too. I download my Bible as well. But at the end of the day, I'm reading paper because this is the sword of my spirit. And when I read this, let me tell you, this is powerful. The Word of God is a two-edged sword. As a matter of fact, it does amazing things. But when I first became a believer in Jesus Christ, I, before I was, I was already reading the Bible for about a month or two. I didn't understand it, but I knew that it was inspirational. I read it whenever I needed to, whenever it brought comfort to me, but I didn't really get it. But when I gave my life to Christ, now all of a sudden, I want the Word. I want to read it. And then with the Holy Spirit now inside of me, it illuminated the Scripture like never before. And I understood what it was finally saying. I might have not had all the knowledge, but at least I got it now because my spirit was reading what God had birthed in the Spirit, this Bible. When I was working at American Airlines, my job was to load the, load the plane. Throw the bags on the plane, put it, or drive the loader. Um, one of my most interesting jobs so I could have Sundays off was I was the lavatory man. I drove the truck underneath the airplane. I hooked up the hose in order to dump the waste of 250 passengers over a long haul trip over the Pacific and put it into a truck and dump it somewhere else. There's another story for that. I'll tell you another time. But my main job sometimes was closing up the final bags in the back of the airplane. Underneath the tail at the very back, this is where they put the surfboards, the golf bags, and the last-minute passengers that make, it, make their way through. I was sitting on my tractor. Actually, it's a conveyor belt that goes up to the top. The conveyor belt to go to, to the top of the door in the bottom of the tail of the airplane. And I was sitting there, and I was reading a small Bible. I didn't want to bring my big Bible at the time. I had bigger Bibles before. Anyway, but back then, I had a smaller Bible. Kept it in my back pocket. It was only Psalms and Proverbs and the New Testament. I'd read it. And a pilot was doing his final check, looking at the airplane, and he came up to me, surprisingly, and he was happy. He goes, oh, you're reading the good book. I'm like so new as a Christian. I don't even know what I'm talking about. What? He's like, the good book. What? The good book. You're reading the good book. My good night. And he walked away. I was like, oh, the Bible is called the good book? I didn't know. So if this was the sword of the Spirit, that little Bible was my dagger. That's my dagger. I'm going to cut you, Satan. Cut. Cut you back with whatever you're doing. Anyway, so that's what it was. 7.15, love that animation. 8.30, a little slow. But anyway, moving right along. See, here's what I believe. The Word of God is my armor and my arsenal. Here's number three. You ready? I'm almost done. Number three. God uses the Bible to feed me. God uses the Bible to feed me online. When I think about this in Honolulu, I think about this in Mililani, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Satan had tempted Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. When he comes out of the wilderness, there's one thing that he was tempting him with, and that was food in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. But Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. In other words, they don't live just by manapua. They don't just live by sweet bread. They don't live by bread. They live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, and that is his daily bread, his daily bread to us. It's his word. It's his word. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 2, Paul admonishes the church in Corinth and he scolds them. And he says, I had to feed you with milk. 
with, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. You couldn't handle more than milk. And you still aren't ready. And he says, and you still aren't ready. You can't handle the meat. Come on, everybody. Think about this. They were approving of an adulterous, incestual relationship in the church in Corinth. And he said, you can't even handle the milk. If I gave you meat, you couldn't handle that either. Think about this. The Word of God feeds me. It's compared to milk, but it's also compared to meat. We have to feed ourselves. We can't wait for every weekend to get fed. You have to read the Bible on your own. This is a Bible. When we read that every single day, he grows us. He feeds us spiritually. Um, God does amazing things. We need to learn to feed ourselves on a daily basis. Here's number four. Number four, the Word of God transforms me. The Word of God transforms me. How does it transform me? The more I read it, the more I want to become more like Jesus. The more that I read it, the more that he comforts my soul. The more that I read it, he begins to stir me up for freedom. The more that I read it, I understand who I am in Christ rather than what other people are telling me, what the world is showing me. The more I read it, he changes my mind. He renews my mind. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 verse 2, let's go to verse 2, says don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. What everybody else is doing, don't copy it. You don't have to be like that. You don't have to buy it. Don't even copy it. Don't buy it, don't copy it. If it's not in God's word, don't live by it. Don't accept it. Love, but don't accept it in your life. He says, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Right now, there's a battle for your mind. Not just a battle for your soul. There's a battle for your mind. Not just a battle for our souls. So how do we protect this mind? By the word of God. Don't let it puff you up and make you prideful like I see sometimes. Not in you guys, but but I'm just kidding. But don't let it puff you up. Like, I know scripture. I'm going to tell you about, you know, you need to live your life right. That's in the church. That's not outside. We hold each other to a higher standard in the church. In the world, we don't hold them to a standard because to to them, we're foolish scripturally that's what it says it says but when we do this you will learn to know god's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect here's number five number five the word of god prevents sin in my life the word of god prevents me from sinning will we sin yes we will but it prevents me from sinning i have hidden your word in my heart that i might not sin against you come on come on i've hidden your word in my heart that i might not sin against you to hide means to treasure to treasure means to store up. And when I hide it in my heart, God does amazing things. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is alive and powerful. Honolulu, watch this. And is, is powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and our desires. So you get a chance to read Psalm 1 today. Psalm 1, it looks like what the life of a flourishing person looks like because of the Word of God. Here's number six. The Word of God provides me guidance. The Word of God provides me guidance. Psalm 119, 105. Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's not that God's going to light up with a LED light your whole path. It's, it's a small little light. And back then, you had olive oil and a wick and a small little clay holder like this and you needed to keep it close to you but you had to hold it a little bit closer to your feet because it would be a light for your path your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path i will see the path that god has for me whenever i'm in the word somebody say amen come on here we go a lot of people read the bible compared to a few people allowing the bible to read them let the bible read you james chapter 1 verse 20 5 verse 25 says but if you look carefully everybody say carefully into the perfect law say perfect that sets you free say free and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard then God will bless you for doing it 66 books 40 authors inspired by the Holy Spirit 39 in the Old Testament 27 in the New Testament written through the breath of God inspired by the Holy Spirit this is God's love letter to man What if we were to scroll through this more than we we would scroll through our feed? What what if we gave it equal time? What would our lives look like? What if we did a little bit less of the feed and started feeding ourselves in the Word of God? What would that do to us mentally? 
having difficulty making a tough decision, go to the book of Proverbs to my friend Solomon. Look, dealing with depression, sorrow, anxiety, stuck in the doldrums, let me take you to David, Solomon's dad, who went through the same thing. Uh, feel like you need spiritual kick in the behind, read the book of James. He will give you a mirror and you will look at yourself and don't forget what you look like. Looking to rebuild your life? Go to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah will tell you how to battle on one side and pray on the other. Come on, you want to see the foundations of this earth? I mean the foundations of this nation? I want to take you to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible that we say thank God for setting that foundation. Only two nations on earth said God is theirs. Our founding fathers in 1776 and the people of Israel. Only two nations on this earth. Can I tell you the two most blessed nations on this earth? America and Israel. America and Israel. I've been from sea to shining sea this summer. God has shed His grace on thee. God bless America and all God is doing. Don't worry, I'm not a nationalist. I'm not a nationalist. I'm a Christian who happens to be a patriot and who's part Hawaiian and Filipino in Jesus' name. Come on, are you ready for God to do something in this nation? Are you ready for God to do something back in your heart? Are you ready? Because I know I am. Come on, this is the Bible. This is my Bible. Come on, lift, up it, lift it up if you got it. If it's in your phone, lift your phone up right now and let's pray. Come on, don't sit. Come on, everybody stand. Everybody stand. Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. We are standing on the Word of God. We are standing in your presence. We are standing on your truths while the world is sitting down. God, we are standing up. We will not bow down. We will stand strong in the Lord, in His mighty Word. We thank you for the sacrifices of men who put this Bible together. We thank you, Lord, for Tyndale. We thank you for Gutenberg. Father, we thank you for all of these men who knew that this was precious. And Lord, let us not forget your good and precious promises that you give to us. We love you, Lord. We bless you. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Listen, if you've never given your life to Jesus, I want everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes for a few moments. It's the Word of God that transforms you. It's the Word of God God uses. Uh, His Holy Spirit will come into your life and change you from the inside out if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done in your life, if you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus, today is the day of your salvation. He loves you so much. The word that we have today is written on our hearts. But what Jesus did for us was spilled all over that cross over 2,000 years ago. It was His blood that was shed for all humanity, for all of us. And if you've never done that, then today is the day that you do. Today is the day that you surrender. The days are getting darker. We are accelerating at an alarming pace of where this world is headed. In America, and throughout the rest of the world and Hawaii is right behind it we are in some difficult days but it is the people of God who stand firm who pray in the spirit at all times who are praying for our government who are praying saints for unity who are standing firm don't be dismayed by what you see. Be concerned, but be prayerful in the name of Jesus. But if you've never given your life to Jesus, I'd love to lead you in that prayer. All you got to do is raise your hand to repeat that prayer. But what you need to do from this moment on is get planted in the church. Grow your roots deep so that when the winds blow, and the rains come, let me tell you, you will be strong and your foundation will be firm. If that's you today, that you want the forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life in heaven, because there's only two places. There is a heaven and a hell. Both. Only two. You're not coming back. There's no reincarnation. There's no purgatory. That intermediate state where you get prayed out of. No. There's only two places. The presence of God or hell that's the alternative so you don't want to die when we all have we all will die and one day and when we die this earth and our life here is but a vapor the Bible says a vapor 
but eternity is with him. He created you for eternity. You were made for eternity. Your spirit will live on for eternity. But you're not going to hover over the earth. You're not going to become another animal. You're not going to become another person. Your spirit has an opportunity to go to heaven. And you have to know this. Like you can't, you can't roll the dice on this. You can't, I hope I go to heaven. You can't hope your way to heaven. You can't think I'm going to go to heaven. There's no justice scales in heaven. It's not good deeds outweigh bad deeds and 50-50 or you 51-49. Okay, come in to the pearly gates. St. Peter's welcoming you in. Uh-uh. It's only two places. And you know what? It's based upon this question. Here's the question you will be asked. What? What did you do with my son Jesus? A one question test. And it's open book. What have you done with my son Jesus? And if you, if you want to surrender your life to him, in its simplicity and all purity, simplicity and all purity, to surrender your life to Jesus, he will come into your heart. He loves you so much, he'll change you from the inside out. You'll be washed as clean as white as snow because we've all sinned and all fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us have sinned. But Jesus came as the good news to pay the price for that sin so that you wouldn't have to pay it. I don't have to pay. You don't have to pay. He already paid. Now, how do we give back by living our life for Him from this moment forward? Clean that up, fix that, repair that, let that go, move on. All these different things are part of the journey. So if that's you, from the front, back, left, right, online, no matter who you are, where you've been, what you think up until this moment, what you lived up until this moment, successful, struggling, God is no respecter of persons. If you've never given your life to Jesus, in this room and online and in Honolulu and Minilani, enter this right now. Get ready. At the count of three, I'm going to clap my hands. And when I do, I want you to raise your hand to surrender your life to Jesus. And He will come into your heart and change you forever. Get ready. One, He will never let you down. Two, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world, the Bible says, to condemn the world, but to save it. That's his mission. Get ready. One, two, three. Anybody here today? says, Mike, that's who I want, that's what I want. Online, Honolulu Milinani, that's who I want, that's what I want. Anybody hands up here in this room today? That's who I want, that's what I want. One right there, God bless you. Two right here, amen. And three over here, and four and five and six. Awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Awesome. Amen. 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 Hey, listen, this is my last call. Keep your eyes closed one more time. This is my last call. No light is shining on you right now. There is no LED on your life right now. There's only the light of Christ. If you've never given your life to Jesus and now you want to do that, let me give you one last time. You can come back next week too, but today, let me give you one more shot. Raise your hand at the count of three if you haven't raised your hand yet. One, two, three. Anybody else? There you go. One, two. God bless you. Three right here. God bless you. I got you. I got you. I got you. Amen. Let's put our hands down. God is doing something in every person's heart right now. Some are already saved. Some are coming to the cross. And some are on that journey. Continue your journey. Everybody repeat after me. Say, Jesus, today I surrender and give you my life. I thank you for dying on the cross, shedding your blood that washes my sins as white as snow. I also thank you that when I die, I will be in your presence for all eternity. While I'm here, be my strength for today, hope for tomorrow, my ever-present help in my time of need. I'm born again. The old is past. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, created to serve you and to bring you glory. Thank you for the new life you gave me. In Jesus' name I pray, and everybody said, Amen. Come on, everybody, let's thank the Lord.